Hi, everybody, and welcome to Ringside Rivalries here on ESPN Classic. I'm Brian Kenny, coming to you from Gleason's Gym in New York. This is the home away from home to many of the all-time greats. Originally located in the Bronx, Gleason's is now in Brooklyn, which, of course, is the ancestral home to one of sports' greatest rivalries, the Dodgers and the Giants. But no sport has head-to-head -head or toe-to-toe -to -toe rivalries like boxing. For the next six hours, we'll look back at the sport's greatest matchups. We'll roll out the vintage bounce from the classic library and sprinkle some hidden gems from the archives. Plus, have commentary throughout this marathon broadcast from our distinguished panel. Joining me here at Gleason's is my co-host, boxing historian, and the only man to watch more gladiators in action than Emperor Nero. Two names not enough, Bert, Randolph, Sugar, the legendary trainer of Muhammad Ali, Angelo Dundee, the former welterweight and middleweight champion of the world, Carmen Basilio, another celebrated trainer, Gil Clancy, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, Dave Anderson of the New York Times, author, journalist, and longtime boxing observer, Pete Hamill, and Showtime boxing analyst, and our old ESPN boxing friend, Al Bernstein. Here are some of the all-time marquee matchups on tap. Jack Dempsey, Gene Tunney, two legendary heavyweight champions from the Roaring Twenties. They slugged it out in two of the most famous fights of the 20th century. Their long count controversy still rages on. We'll have all the action from that epic battle. Joe Lewis, Max Schmeling, a double bill of 1930s intrigue, a fight that transcended sports. We'll review all the political and racial tensions that engulfed not just one, but the two fights and the two prize fighters and the entire world. Sugar Ray Robinson, Jake LaMotta, a rivalry immortalized in the cinematic masterpiece Raging Bull. These two middleweight greats fought six times. That's a rivalry. And their 1951 grand finale is one of boxing's most memorable fights, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. And perhaps the ultimate ring rivals, Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier. Their first bout was the fight, or the fight of the century. Their third contest, the Thrilla in Manila. They chased each other around the world, exchanged the heavyweight crown, and left fight fans with countless indelible images. And if that's not enough, we'll also unspool these gems from the vault. Joe Lewis versus Billy Kahn. Rocky Graziano versus Tony Zale. Sugar Ray Robinson versus Carmen Basilio. Emil Griffith, Benny Perrette. Evander Holyfield, Riddick Bowe, and others. It's a marathon combination of knockouts, comebacks, and bad blood, combined with the sportsmanship and often friendship that often came about after these titans pushed each other to the limits of human endurance. And we get underway our first rivalry that we begin to explore, Burt Randolph Sugar and Al Bernstein. Dempsey and Tunney. First, let's talk about the greatness of Jack Dempsey. How big was he, Burt? When he beat Jess Willard in 1919, July 4th, in Toledo, he became the biggest thing in America. Paul Gallico, who was the sports editor of the New York Daily News, did something by creating a pantheon of greats called the Golden Era of Sports, and the first great he put in it was Jack Dempsey. That was before Babe Ruth and Red Grange and Bill Tilden and Bobby Jones. And Dempsey was the biggest thing in America. First round, he knocks down Willard seven times. And you can see he hardly goes to a neutral corner, which will cost him later. Every time Willard picks his hands up off the canvas, he's back down. And in fact, there was a major to-do to-do that after that first left, he hit him with and broke his jaw in three places. The thought was that Dempsey had plaster of Paris in his hands. His manager, Jack Doc Kearns, said plaster of Paris, hell, it was cement. <laughs> because Kearns had bet 10 to 1 on a $10,000 that he would knock out Willard in the first round, which was understandable because the two fights before this, before the Willard fight, Dempsey had knocked out Fred Fulton and Carl Morris, the number one and two contenders, in 14 seconds and 18 seconds. Mm. I guess, Al, when we're looking at uh, the all-time greats, we have to remember the place and time that Dempsey is coming out of. Absolutely, and you can't take it too literally in terms of how many defenses he had and who he beat and all the rest of it because, as Burke pointed out, he captured the imagination uh, of America. And the other interesting thing I think about this is it shows where boxing fit into the scheme of things. 
that Burt rightly says he was as big or bigger than Babe Ruth. Babe so, Ruth was jealous of yeah. him for his popularity. Mm. He gave us million dollar gates, 120,000 in a stadium. I mean, just think of that. He was bigger than, and made boxing bigger than baseball, dare I say. And headlines on the front page of the New York Times as if world war had been declared. So I mean, where does Gene Tunney come into this? Where he's fighting as a light heavyweight, right? He's, he's fighting got his wars with Greb. He's fighting as a light heavyweight. He had been the AEF, American Expeditionary Force, World War I. I always liked that. I wonder if they labeled World War I, World War I, because there was, <laughs> there was another war coming. We're expecting a few more. <laughs> yes, There'll be a few more two, down the line. Two yes. and three. It's an interesting historical <laughs> question, yeah. actually. Yeah. But he was the AEF champion, came out uh, out of Greenwich Village, New York. He was known as the Fighting Marine, and he was the American heavyweight, uh, light heavyweight champion. He was beaten by Harry Greb so badly that they thought he should quit. He went back in against Greb and beat him four times after that. He was a, a made fighter. Some people are born, some people make themselves. He picked up part of the style of a Tommy Gibbons, part of the style of a Jack Dillon known as the giant killer, part of the style of Benny Leonard who was a stable partner. And he learned, but was, and he was fast. He could hit. He knocks out Carpentier as a heavyweight. He knocks out a lot of people. But what he was known for is probably the greatest scientific fighter since James J. Corbett. Hmm. It's interesting too, Al, because he's a guy, as you say, a made fighter. He's a guy who did resistance training, you know, early weightlifting things. He was looking to better himself in every way, and mm -hmm. but also with his reading and his quoting of, of Shakespeare yeah, he, and he, he, literary he, he things. He counted people like George Bernard Shaw as his friend. Yeah. Uh, you know, he was he was a very he, uh, a very bright guy who, as you point out, was a thinking man's fighter as well. And yet, of course, you had George Bernard Shaw as a friend, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> no, William, little Willie Shakespeare. Oh, that was it. Okay. Uh, set, but, set up but, this first fight. All right, but you know, here was Will Rogers saying about Gene Tunney, what this country needs in a heavyweight is more sock, not more Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. But Gene Tunney has always had in his focus one thought. He wants Dempsey because he knows he can beat Dempsey. Dempsey to him is a sucker for his right hand because Dempsey, who had the greatest left in the history of boxing, Jack Doc Kearns taught him to throw the left by tying his right hand behind him and sparring. But he can beat him with his right hand, says Tunney, and he's got him in his, in his crosshairs, and he's been campaigning for a fight. Now Dempsey, after beating Jess Willard and fighting one of the greatest fights of all time against Louis Angel Furpo in, in Polo Grounds in 1923, defends, and he had just defended in Shelby, Montana, and then he fights Brennan, and then he goes off to Hollywood. Even has a nose job to be in movies, cause, and he marries Estelle Taylor, a movie star. So he's over there. He's not paying any attention. Three years later. Three years, yeah. He comes back. Sitting on the title out, yes. Yes, put it under his arm, took it to <laughs> Hollywood, and he now is fighting Tunney. And Tunney, in, in a Tex Rickard million dollar fight, at Philadelphia Sesquicentennial Stadium, a hundred thousand people come to it, and Tunney scares the bejabbers out of the promoter Tex Rickard by flying to the fight from New York, and it sets up this magnificent million-dollar fight, the biggest thing to happen in the heavyweight division ever. All right, let's take a look. Round number one again: Gene Tunney challenging for the heavyweight title against Jack Dempsey in 1926. In round one, Gene Tunney with a crew haircut has the darker trunks. It's starting to rain, but the fight is going to continue. 130,000 fans here tonight, the largest gate in the history of American sports. Dempsey hasn't fought for three years. 
But even so, everyone figures it's a cinch for him to win by a knockout within a few rounds. Tunney looks pale, seems tense. Dempsey's best punch is his left hook. He destroyed those two giants, Jess Willard and Louis Burpo. He's got the best one-two combination in the business. While he doesn't have Dempsey's power, he can hurt you plenty. The end of round one. Dempsey always moving forward, bobbing, weaving, trying to get one good poke at Tunney. for the heavyweight crown. Gene started out to be a lawyer, but joined the Marines in 1918. He began boxing in the service. He won the AEF championship and then decided to go into the fight game instead of the law. Tunney has lost that tenseness of the early rounds. He's relaxed now, cool, fighting his own fight. Pretty good beating up to now. His face is badly swollen. His right eye is cut and closed. Dempsey in the lighter trunks. Jack is desperate. He's way behind. He knows his only chance to keep his title now is by a knockout.
That long three-year layoff has had its effect on Dempsey. His own speed is gone. His timing is off. And here in the tenth round, he's pretty well used up. and the rain is coming down in torrents, almost a cloudburst. The end of the fight. Honey, the winner by unanimous decision. No hard feelings on Dempsey's part. He congratulates Gene Tunney, the new heavyweight champion of the world. So Tunney wins a unanimous decision in Philadelphia, outboxing and outfighting the great Dempsey. While the boxing experts predicted that Tunney would break and run from Dempsey's gladiator rushes, the fighting Marine lived up to his nickname with a hammering attack on the Manassas Mauler. Here is the newspaper account of the fight in the New York Times. Quote, there was no question of the victor. At the finish, Dempsey, instead of flashing the fighting fury and tigerish rushes, which was expected from him, proved himself instead a floundering, weakened, almost helpless fighting machine from which the spark has gone. Ouch. The Tunney Dempsey rematch at Soldier Field, Chicago in 1927, drew over 100,000 fans and set a record by netting $2.65 million at the gate. An estimated 60 million people listened to the fight on the radio, and it was billed as the Battle of the Ages. Dempsey predicted that Tunney wouldn't make it to the ninth round, while the champion boasted he would knock Dempsey out. Along with being one of the most anticipated fights of all time, it was one of the most controversial fights in boxing history. Round one, Tunney in the white trunks, weighs 189 pounds tonight, Dempsey 194. Great Jack Dempsey, one of the most popular champions of all time, fighting tonight to win back the title he lost to Gene Tunney the year before. Dempsey's loss to Tunney in their first fight was considered a terrific upset. Over a hundred thousand fans here in Soldiers Field tonight. Biggest crowd in all boxing history. Two and a half million dollar gate. All-time record. This great crowd has come to see if Dempsey can do what no other heavyweight champion has ever done, win back the title after once losing it. The second Gene Tunney, Jack Dempsey heavyweight title fight had followed the same pattern as the first fight. Tunney had the fight under control using his jab to keep Dempsey at bay. But in the seventh round, the former champion stunned Tunney with a left cross and then knocked him to the canvas with a volley of blows. What followed next was one of the most controversial incidents in the history of sports, the infamous long count that spared Tunney his title. Now round seven, Tunney in the white trucks. A lot depends on Dempsey's legs tonight. 
Tunney's much faster than Dempsey. Tunney down. Referee Dave Barry motions Dempsey to a neutral corner. Pound is nine. Tunney is up. Tunney trying to stay away from Dempsey. Trying to last out the round. Dempsey's fans yelling to Jack to corner Tunney. But Tunney's too fast. Jack's legs just can't carry him that fast anymore. Dempsey's getting disgusted. He screams at Tunney, quit running away, come back and fight. But Tunney stays on that bicycle. He's not ready to trade punches with Dempsey yet a while. Tunney appears to be recovering from that knockdown. He's fast, even though he's been going backwards. His jab is straight and hard. His right cross has the old sting again. There's the end of round seven, one of the most famous rounds in the entire history of boxing. In the seventh round, he catches Tunney with a bodacious left hook and follows it up with a six-punch combination. Tunney is dazed, Tunney is down, Tunney is out. And nobody really knew he was badly hurt, but he was badly hurt and he sat there. Dempsey, his instinct takes over. He refuses to go to a neutral corner. The referee orders him to a neutral corner. Dempsey, as in the old days, standing over Tunney, ready to pounce and destroy him. For the first time in boxing history, there is a clause that says the fighter scoring a knockdown must go to a neutral corner. Ironically, it was insisted upon by Dempsey. The referee kept waving at him to move over, and when he finally did, the time on the timekeeper's clock was five seconds. And they came back. Instead of starting on six, he started on one, two, three. As a consequence, Tunney is on the canvas for fully 14 seconds, according to the watches of all the reporters who were at the site. Eight, eight, nine, and Tunney is up. And now they're at it again. Tunney is backing away, and Dempsey is following Tunney. If he hadn't have had those extra five or six seconds, would his mind have been clear enough to stay away from Dempsey the remainder of the round? He said, I could have gotten up what I don't know is whether I could have gotten away. Uh, that extra four seconds gave him enough time. All right, so there it is, the long count, Bert. But as we'd seen before, Dempsey had a propensity to stand over a guy and drill him back down to the canvas. There was a reason why the neutral corner was put into effect. Well, it was an agreement by both uh, camps. This was the first time it was really put into a contract. It, a fighter because of Dempsey, really. Though there were some theses that said that Dempsey put it in because of his eyes. They had been injured badly in the first Tunney fight. He'd stuck enough lefts in his, in his eyes. But they agreed to it, and what happened was Dempsey did not go to a neutral corner. He just stood over him. Now, let me just give you a couple quick notes here. Number one of which is after the first fight in which Dempsey in the rain in Philadelphia lost 10 out of 10 rounds, was a 10-round fight. He wasn't sure he wanted to fight Tony again. He fought Jack Sharkey. And in that fight, he continues to foul Sharkey because Dempsey would hit you anything, anywhere, anytime. And Sharkey turned to the referee to complain, and a left hook separated him 
from his senses and his complaints. So they set up the 27 <laughs> fight a year later in Chicago. 120,000 people come. Now, there were rumors that Al Capone somehow, someway, somewhere has gotten to the referee and bet a lot of money on Dempsey. The afternoon of the fight, a new referee, Dave Berry, is inserted. The man thought to be a, if you will, friend of Al Capone's is pulled out by the Illinois State Athletic Commission. This is Dave Berry in here who is moving Dempsey, trying to get him somehow, someway, somewhere to a neutral mm -hmm. corner. Dempsey finally figures out. Paul Gallico, sitting in the press section, is watching, and a man behind him, as Tunney finally gets up, taps him on the shoulder and says, uh, I had a stopwatch. I clicked it when he went down. Fourteen and a half seconds. And, and Gallico looks at the little old man and figures out it's battling Nelson, the former great lightweight champion, mm -hmm. who is keeping count. From that point on, it became known as the long count. Fourteen and a half seconds, and the question still remained, could Tunney have gotten up before ten if Dempsey had gone to a neutral corner? As you see, he runs around the ring. Well, let's take a look at it right now. We want to look at this, and we're going to have the clock on it. We're going to set that. And, of course, now, Al, we're, we're used to now, in watching all these fights, we're used to a referee might not start a count until he gets the guy to the neutral corner. This is new, though, at this point, and we're going to start the clock. Yeah, that, and as you can see, a count should have been started at this juncture. And, look, it's taken him twice yeah. to get Dempsey over to Dempsey a neutral didn't corner. Dempsey get there, and by now, an extra four, five, or six seconds. Now, it looks like Tunney maybe could have gotten up a few seconds before this. He's got the count in mind now. And now he's up running because Dempsey is loaded for bear. But Dempsey can't catch Tunney. Tunney practiced running backwards. I mean, before Ali and who ran backwards, Tunney did it. Also, Al, another thing to bring out is a lot of times a referee now will pick up the count, but for many fights, the referee won't pick up a count. He has his own count. He starts the count mm -hmm. if the other fighter isn't cooperating with him. I guess there's different ways of doing this. Well, and and the uh, at ringside, they start the count for the referee as well while he's getting the, the fighter into the neutral corner. Um, you know, it, it's interesting. Gene Tunney was really the kind of the guy, in my opinion, that invented the phrase boxer puncher. He really did. And we saw evidence of his of this when once he was knocked down, as, as Bert pointed out, and he got up, when he got up in this fight and started moving, you knew this fight was over. But it wasn't mm -hmm. going to be a win for Jack. And, and everybody forgets one thing. In the eighth round, Tunney knocks down Dempsey. Yeah, that's right. Hmm. And the referee does not make Tunney go to a neutral corner. Oh, no. Ah. Ah. Well, first, let's go back again. This is 1927. We have the radio call to listen in right now. Clem McCarthy with the uh, radio call at the time of Dempsey and Tunney. Which he follows up with two mean left. And as the left is in, is in Dempsey's face, he lands a right. Then Dempsey comes back and that's Tony is down. Tony is down from a barrage of left and right to the face. Count is going on. Tony's down. Dempsey is on the other side. And eight, nine, and Tony is up. And now they're at it again. Tony. Tunney is backing away, and Dempsey is following Tunney. Yeah, Clem McCarthy had picked up the, the count of the referee, of Barry, who his count and I, never, that and Tunney heard. And never mentioned long count. Right. Well, maybe it's hard to, as a broadcaster, Al, it's hard to pick all these things up at the time, and you can miss that sort we, of thing. We writers can do that. Well, yeah, well, yeah because you have, you're doing it the day later. Because, well, you guys went to college, I think. Yeah, yeah. What, how do you spell that? One man died of a heart attack while this was going on mm. in the stadium. And it became a major cause celebre. And there was sympathy given to Dempsey, mm -hmm. yep. not to Tunney, because of this. Everybody arguing Dempsey won. And Dempsey said, I loved it. I made a lot of money out of that long count. Because he had become not so popular a champion. Some people accused him of being a draft dodger. There was a lot of, he, he, was, he was not fighting often. No. So he became less popular. And so this kind of helped boost his popularity back. Well, back during the, the WW1, yeah. he was pictured pitching hay. Why, yeah. why, 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 why he was not in the service, he was helping. Yeah. Meanwhile, They'd forgotten to change his patent leather shoes while he was in overalls. Yeah. <laughs> he became known as quote unquote a slacker yeah. and was even tried but acquitted mm. as a slacker, draft dodger in, the, in, the, in our terms. 
And no, he was not popular, but all of a sudden, he has become very popular now, and more so because of the long count. What's the relationship between the two? Oh, it was very, very close. Dempsey never regretted this, and in fact, he campaigned for Tunney's John son Tunney, yeah. in, ca in California. Mm. John Tunney used to say, come and see me, Jack Dempsey will be here, mm -hmm. and won in a landslide. Tunney only, this is Dempsey's last fight, Tunney fights right. one more time, Tom Heaney, and, uh, but for this fight, and then retires, marries, and does well. For this fight, Tunney gets a check from Tex Rickard for the Chicago second fight for $990,000. He won't take it. He writes his own check to Rickard for 10000 and gets a million dollar check. Mm -hmm. That, a photostat of that check still hangs in his son's garage. Mm. Think of the money. Compared to, this is an era when uh, even yep. Babe Ruth, who was making, I believe, about $80,000, 80, mm -hmm. but most players are making several thousand dollars. Even, even Lou Gehrig would, would top it, would get about, what, twenty five, thirty five thousand. He's making a million dollars for this fight. That is a monster skate. And then he did another good thing. He married a steel heiress. So, Tony really Holy secured, ladder. yeah, he really secured his uh, financial future very well. Not suggesting he didn't marry for love, but I'm saying in addition to the million, it, it's nice to be able to love money. <laughs> <laughs> and next up, the first fight between Joe Lewis and Max Schmeling from Yankee Stadium in 1936. The two fight series became, of course, much more than a sporting event. Adolf Hitler used the fights as a propaganda tool to promote his repulsive racial policies, and the bouts came to symbolize two countries on the verge of war. All right, Bert. Uh, it's kind of a difficult situation to look at, and you can examine it from many different ways. Where do you stand on, on Max Schmeling kind of riding the line and trying to, he's not a Nazi, would not buy in, and yet had to ride a certain line, and he did allow himself to be used as a propaganda tool. There was a famous line by John, John Calhoun who didn't agree with a lot of what was going on pre-Civil War, my country, right or wrong, my country. I once asked Max Schmeling, I had a chance to meet with him, I said, well, you had dinner with the Fuhrer. And he said, yeah, I had turned the Fuhrer down four times. You did not turn the Fuhrer down five. And he paused and then he said, but I had dinner with Franklin Roosevelt. That did not make me a Democrat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he said it straight-facedly. I didn't know if he had any humor or not. But he had a Jewish manager, Joe Jacobs. He had Jewish friends. He saved two yes, kids during Kristallnacht, and I know one of them. Uh, two Jewish kids in his hotel room. So, Max Schmeling was a fair-minded person, but yes, it was his country. Mm -hmm. He didn't know how to deal with it. His wife, by the by, Annie uh, Sundra, uh, was thought to be a Nazi. She was a Czechoslovakian film star. But Schmeling, I think, yes, was an opportunist, uh, opportunist, but yes, he also had, as you say, using your words, Brian, he had to ride a line that was a very thin one. Mm -hmm. And a dangerous one, too, as well. Al, at this point, I don't know if people who are uh, you know, too young to remember this realize how big a star Joe Lewis was in this country before he became champion. How big was Joe Lewis before this fight with Schmel? Well, he was, he was considered, obviously, you know, the, there had not been a black champion since Jack Johnson. And uh, fight fans really got a kick out of Joe Lewis. Uh, and even though he had had... Uh, uh, you know, going into the Schmeling fight, uh, a, there was a lot of popularity, and I think people were anxious to see what, what he would be able to do against Schmeling. He had beaten before Schmeling Jack Sharkey. Uh, no, I'm yeah. sorry, the Sharkey was after. He'd beaten Primo Canera and Max Baer. And this was thought to be Schmeling in, in the first fight, just another one of those warm bodies who had once worn a title. Mm -hmm. And yet, Schmeling, after watching Lewis in action against Polina Yuzgadan, said, I seed something. And what he had seen was Lewis dropped his left hand after jabbing and that he was going to cross over with his right. And he did. Hmm. Great footage there, by the way, as we see uh, Joe Lewis known going to, I believe, Pompton Lakes, New Jersey. Yeah, but he didn't, he, train, he didn't train for the first fight. He played golf. That is one thing that he admitted that 
he yep. at that point reached a point of overconfidence after the mm -hmm. unbeaten starching everybody in the first round obviously going to be the next champion and he was overconfident going and, into and that he, fight and he hadn't trained yeah i think they thought he was going to hit schmeling with a right hand and that was going to be the end of it uh and, and i think that did breed a lot of overconfidence uh, in him another note about schmeling in addition to what we talked about he helped jews escape nazi germany in addition to the people he yeah. hid he helped people escape uh, for Nazi Germany. And, and, so. and they went out through China because the, the western part was blocked. So they went out through Shanghai. But Lewis was such a favorite, not only of the fans, but of the betting crowd, that the days before the first fight in 36, nobody was picking Schmeling. Mm -hmm. And there was a famous scene at the New York Journal American where Bill Farnsworth, the editor, is looking around for anybody. Please, we need somebody to pick Schmeling. We're selling newspapers here. Mm -hmm. He picked his son a copy boy. You know, here are all the, here are all the choices for Lewis. Here, here's Bill Farnsworth Jr. Schmeling. When Schmeling won, Bill Farnsworth Jr. became an instant celebrity, and he hadn't picked him. His father had picked him for him. In the fight itself, I think it's amazing to look back and, and, and see uh, and, and not be just swayed by what you hear later and what, what is written, but to watch the domination of Max Schmeling. That it wasn't just one shot that yeah. he nailed Lewis with. He hit him with that shot and that right hand out repeatedly with that shot and, and, and beat him down. It's amazing how much that punch lands when you look at the, uh, the footage. And he, he totally controlled the fight. And it speaks to two things. It wasn't that he just saw one thing he could do, although that was that landing that right was a big deal. It also speaks to the fact that Joe Lewis was ill-prepared for this fight. There's no question about it. And the Max Schmeling did certainly have ability. Now, he was a little older fighter at this juncture. He wasn't as, you know, as young when, when he um, uh, had some bigger wins. But still, Max Schmeling had a lot of ability. And Max Schmeling would just raise yes. his shoulder to stay off Lewis's right. He was James right. Tony before James Tony. <laughs> and, and, he, and he kept his right. We haven't heard that before about Max Schmeling, yes. <laughs> there you go. He, he kept his right. Schmeling, by the by, was popular for one reason in America. He looked like Jack Dempsey. Though he was That's the true. black no, Ulan, That's yeah. true. he looked like Jack Dempsey. So people, in effect, cast him as the natural successor to Dempsey. And he just stayed there and waited. He, he took everything Lewis mm. threw for three and a half rounds waiting for that one moment, and it came in the fourth. Right. Max Schmeling, let's hear uh, from the man himself again, an interview with Max Schmeling on and what he did see, what he saw in Joe Lewis that helped him win that first fight. And Joe Lewis was, was fighting Paulino Utskutum. And Paulino never been on the floor. And I was sitting on the ring, very close, and Joe put Paulino down and right in my lap nearly. And it was the first time you, uh, you, uh, first time Paulino got knocked out. And then all the newspaper men came near me. Well, Max, what do you say now? Uh, don't you think this is a Superman? And I said, uh, I like to fight Joe. And I saw some things, and I believe I can beat him on that. What did, he, what did, he, what did you see? I, said, I won't tell you. Uh, I tell you after the fight. Joe uh, hit his left hand, and then he, he dropped it. And I was a good puncher, I mean a good counter puncher. And I was waiting when I took the, I took the left hand from, from Joe and then I went right behind him because his hand dropped it. And I got him, hit him every time on the chin and I hit him a little higher on, on the, and he got a very swollen face. Lewis Schmeling too, one of the greatest uh, sporting events in all of history. Uh, and it's fascinating with all the, uh, the political events going around between Nazi Germany and the United States and Schmeling and Lewis, there's boxing politics as well. I think people out there might not realize that it is Schmeling who dominates Joe Lewis, knocks out Joe Lewis, but it's Joe Lewis who gets the shot at the title. How does that happen, Bert? There's a war going on, small W versus what, what is to come, between 20th century boxing, which is Mike Jacobs, and Madison Square Garden, Jimmy Johnston. Jimmy Johnston has the contract for Max Schmeling for the Garden. Mike Jacobs has the contract for Joe Lewis. So what has J Mike Jacobs does is he gets Braddock and Braddock's manager, Joe Gould, to agree to take 10% of Lewis's purse for the next 10 years. Hmm. They get the fight, even though Max Schmeling comes to New York and stands on the scale for a weigh-in the fight between Lewis and Braddock is in Chicago, and Lewis wins. This is the Cinderella man, Al, who is cashing in because he sees Lewis, and he knows he's not going to be a champion very long. 
Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and then that fight took place, and of course it catapulted Lewis um, to the fight with Schmeling and uh, created this situation where it could be a champion fighting uh, Max Schmeling. And yet it was Lewis who had to, you know, really avenge this loss. What was the, the thought as far as him being a champion, but still that unavenged knockout loss to Max Schmeling? He thought he'd never be considered a champion, at least in his mm -hmm. own mind, until he avenged his loss to Schmeling. And though he defended first against Tommy Farr and then against John Henry Lewis, he wanted Schmeling. So in 1938, two years after the first loss to Schmeling, one year after he wins from Braddock, Lewis climbs in the ring in what many considered politically and sociologically as the war to come battle. There were people who didn't want that fight to take place because they thought if Schmeling won, and there mm -hmm. was still the belief he could, right. he would take that title home to Germany and it would be frozen and it would never come back. There were pickets outside. There was a lot of turmoil in the stadium, Yankee Stadium that night. This was a massive event. Yeah, here is Yankee Stadium, 80,000 people coming in. Uh, yeah, the tension in this fight is incredible. And to, to buttress what Bert said, it shows you how important the heavyweight championship was and how America viewed it then. The idea of this uh, championship going to Europe and more importantly, going to a country where we had seen all, Schmeling was being used uh, for propaganda to show the Aryan race was superior. Let it be known that America was not above using Joe Lewis for propaganda Absolutely. for de democratic ends. Right. Franklin Roosevelt at the White House felt That's Joe right. Lewis's arm and said, Joe, we need these muscles for democracy. Mm -hmm. So what you had was the pitting the of democracy battle. versus the Nazi dictatorship, and it was on a world stage. This was not a boxing match. This was a political event. Let's go to Yankee Stadium right now. Again, an estimated 70 million people listened to NBC's radio broadcast of the fight. Clem McCarthy told his audience that, uh, quote, this was the greatest fight of our generation. Let's get to the action, accompanied by McCarthy's radio call. Conley getting last word from Duck Casey and the ready with a bell just about to ring. And there we are. And they got to the ring right together with Arthur Donovan, Stepper and Brown. And Joe Lewis is in the center of the ring, Max going around him. Joe Lewis led quick with two straight lefts to the chin. Both of them light, but as the men clinch, Joe Lewis tries to get over two hard lefts, and Max ties him up in the breakaway clean. On the far side of the ring now, Max with his back to the hook, and Lewis hooks the left to Max's head quickly, and shoots over a hard right to Max's head. Lewis, a left to Max's jaw, a right to his head. Max shoots a hard right to Lewis. Lewis with the old one, two, the first to lift in the fight. And there, Max Schmeling caught him with his guard down and caught that right hand to Lewis's jaw. But Lewis was going away with the punch at the time. Now Max is backing away against the ropes. Lewis is following him and watching for that champ. He is crowding, Schmeling. Schmeling is not sitting around very much, but his head quickly and shoots over a hard right to Max's head. Lewis, a left to Max's jaw, a right to his head. Max shoots a hard right to Lewis. Lewis with the old one, two. The first to lift and then the right. He's landed more blows in this one round than he landed in only five rounds of the other fight. He's not sitting around very much, but his face is already much. And they stepped into a fast clinch and a close range. Lewis fights desperately to bring up a left to the jaw and a right to the body. And coming out of that clinch, he got over a hard right and then stabbed Max with a good straight left jab. And Max backed away and missed the right. Lewis then stopped him with two straight lefts to the face and brought over that hard right to the head. High on the temple. And Max tied him up in a clinch and broke ground. His back against the ropes again there. Not too close to the ropes. Lewis out. And Lewis missed with a left swing, but in close. Brought him a hard right over the to the jaw. And again, a right to the body. A left hook. A right to the head. A left to the head. A right. Schmeling is going down. But he held to his feet, held to the ropes, looked to his corner in helplessness, and Schmeling is down. Schmeling is down. The count is four. It's, and he's up, and Lewis, right and left to the head, a left to the jaw, a right to the head, and Donovan is watching carefully. Lewis measures him, right to the body, a left up to the jaw, and Schmeling is down. The count is five. Six, seven, eight. The men are in the ring. The fight is over. On a technical knockout, Max Schmeling is beaten. It 
Uh, one of the most uh, famous calls in all of sports history, and uh, anybody who became a sportscaster remember, Schmeling is down, um, down five, five, five. five. <laughs> and you're thinking, was it five before, was it five then? Wow, I mean, it's and, incredible and me, to see it. And meanwhile, in the totalitarian country of mm -hmm. Germany, yeah, they, didn't hear that. they pulled the plug. Yep. They stayed up till five That's in the right. morning, and halfway through what was going to be an annihilation, they pulled the plug. Just from what was happening in the ring, why is this fight so different, do you think, Bert? Why is this fight so different from the first one? Well, first of all, Lewis, Lewis was not taking this one for granted. He was not sloughing off. He was training. When Jimmy Cannon went into the dressing room before the fight, who was a dear friend of Joe Lewis's, the writer, Jimmy said, how many rounds? And Joe asked him, how many rounds do you think it'll go? And Jimmy said, five. And Joe Lewis's hands were taped raised one thumb. He knew what he was going to do. He was coming out. Let Schmeling wait to throw his right hand. There was no way he wasn't prepared. And also, I, I think, it, you know, there's been many, there's been books and movies done about this uh, and more to come. Uh, I think Max Schmeling was a preoccupied human being. There was, he was very uncomfortable with the way he was being used before this fight. Uh, there were other distractions. He mentioned his wife, questions about whether his wife was pushing him in a certain direction. How much pressure was he getting at home from the Nazis? A lot on that. Well, Schmeling's you got a telegram. Well. You got a telegram That's before right. the fight from, from Hitler. Yep. We're with you with the Fyodor. Shook him up. His manager couldn't be there that night. Yep. Uh, he was barred for another infraction from another fighter. Uh, he was his handlers. Max Mar Marchant and others who wore Nazi uniforms were basically telling him he was under pressure to win yep. this from the Third Reich. And he went in and they threw things at him as he came into the ring. I mean, he did not go in in a good frame of mind to right. begin with. You can see, and it's important to watch these uh, tapes, watch these old films, you can see, you know, in a fighter, energy comes out of a fighter. Yes. You can feel that, whatever that is, that fighting spirit, and the spirit's very different in Schmeling coming into the second fight. And also fight. Lewis. Absolutely yeah. right. He felt, he felt that was probably Joe Lewis at his peak, at his, at his meanest peak. The Joe Lewis, Max Schmeling rivalry captured the attention of the world, in large part, of course, because of the political overtones. One of the Brown Bombers' most other noted rivals, was Billy Kahn. Now, this was a rivalry based purely on events that took place inside the ring. Kahn, the Pittsburgh kid, held the light heavyweight championship from 1939 to 1941. He gave up the belt to move up in weight to challenge Joe Lewis, the heavyweight champion of the world. The first fight at the Polo Grounds, June 18th, 1941, witnessed by 54,000 people. Al Bernstein, uh, Kahn, this didn't gain weight. Light heavyweight, stayed at about 174 pounds, given up at least 25 pounds to the yeah, champ. giving away a lot of weight, maybe even more than that, Bert well, they, Sugar. They, they minimized the weights. Lewis was 204, they said 199, mm -hmm. just to bring him in under 200. Kahn was 169, yep. they announced him at 174. A way for them to show that this fight was for real, but they didn't need to do that, did they? Because this was for real, because Billy Kahn, who was I think if they had a pound-for-pound pound title back then, he would have been right up near the top two or three. He was a superb boxer, and he used every single skill against Joe Lewis, especially over the initial 12 rounds of this fight, to build up a huge lead. Also, Billy Kahn was fearless. He was fearless. One fight he fought against a fighter named Oscar Rankins, with an S. He was knocked down in an early round, second round. When he gets back to the dressing room, he tells his manager, Johnny Ray, I'm sorry I lost. Ray said, you won. You knocked him out. He never remembered. Mm -hmm. He would fight. He was never knocked out going into the Lewis fight. He turned heavyweight after winning the light heavyweight title and then relinquished it and came into the heavyweight ranks, knocking out people like Bob Pastor, yep, right. whom Lewis had knocked out. Mm. And, but he wasn't a knockout puncher, really. But he decided, as a heavyweight, I better be. What is it, uh, you know, of course, the, the story is that he got overconfident. He figured he'd stay in there and finish him off. Is that the way it really happened, Bert? Well, first thing, let me backtrack. He comes right at the end of what is best known as Joe Lewis's Bum of the Month Club. But Billy right. Kahn was not a bum. You know, so it was the breaking of people who all sounded like their names were Johnny Paycheck. Mm -hmm. Not the country singer, but the, the fighter. But he... For the first couple of rounds, didn't wasn't in the fight. He slipped, he slid. He actually fell down in his corner. He looked so nervous. 
Each round, he gained more confidence. By the seventh or eighth round, he is outpointing Lewis terribly. Not only is he now outpointing, he's starting to slug him. By the twelfth round, he is rocking him, even raising his foot up off the ground, and Lewis is hurt, and the crowd is going wild. Large contingent from Pittsburgh. Yeah, 6,000 people came from Pittsburgh. Yeah, and he was. I mean, he was a favorite in Pittsburgh, and here they all are. Now come the 13th. His manager's in the corner, Johnny Ray, and the other managers are telling him, take it easy. Billy Kahn now thinks he can knock out Lewis. Mm -hmm. Goes right back on the attack. And boom, Lewis, someone you don't trade punches with, particularly if you are outweighed so heavily, starts taking it to Kahn. And, and look at this, and Kahn is taking the punches. Yeah, it's, which is pretty amazing. And at this point, he, one of the cards had him even. He was ahead on two of the cards. So he wasn't assured of a decision win, but boy, he was on his way to a decision win before this happened. And when he's knocked out for the first time in his career, there are only two seconds left in the round. Two seconds. Mm. And afterwards, Jesse Abramson from the, World, from the Herald Tribune goes into the dressing room and says to Billy Con Billy, mm -hmm. why? Why did you do this? You, right. you, could have, you should have, could have, would have won. Billy's answer. What's the sense of being Irish if you can't be stupid? <laughs> <laughs> That's the way he thought. You know, I'm Billy Kahn. I'm not Kahn. taking offense to that. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> on your behalf, I may be. I'm not sure. sure. He said uh, it. I, so, I, I'm just a messenger. How much did it hit him eventually, the lost opportunity here? Eventually, I read that he had wept after the fight. He did, and during the war, when both he and Lewis were in the service, so the title is frozen, they can't fight, Though they were scheduled to fight again in 42, but the Secretary of War Stimson said you can't. But he said to Lewis, Joe, when they met crossing mm -hmm. paths in the USO tour, Joe, why didn't you lend me your crown for 12 months? We could have made a lot of money. And Joe Lewis said, Billy, I lent it to you for 12 rounds and you couldn't <laughs> keep it. <laughs> you know, the other thing about this, uh, my wife's from Pittsburgh, a lot of my friends are from Pittsburgh, and a lot of people from that city. And you know, this is talked about by sports fans, even sports fans that are younger than you'd think would be talking about this. This loss by Billy Kahn has a very important place in the folk, uh, folklore of sports in Pittsburgh. It mm -hmm. was a grave disappointment to that city. And yet it lives on because yes. of how, how much a man outweighed. Yep. This yep. might have been one of the few times that that thesis about a good little man and a good big man, that the good big man doesn't always beat the good little man. The rematch then, Bert, 1946. So it takes a while for this to come back because of World War II. What is it like? A lot of people have, uh, in the service, have lost a lot, Lewis included and Con more so. But Mike Jacobs, head of 20th century, boxing, puts it on and for the first time he charges a hundred dollars for a ringside seat. It's that big. First one was at the polo ground. This is Yankee Stadium, even bigger. The war is over. People are in a spending mood and boxing is still one of the biggest draws. And we go to the rematch, which is nothing like the first fight. Now, it was in the training camp for Joe Lewis where he came up with, he can run, but he can't hide, right? This is the second fight. Yes, I mean, it was philosophical uttering. Unlike in England where the WBO heavyweight champion was once Herbie Hyde and it was said he can Herbie, but he can't hide. <laughs> <laughs> Where he I comes up I, with that out. <laughs> you know what? I, 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 I sit in awe. I, I don't, you know, a Herbie Hyde reference. You can't do better than that. Yeah. So Khan is not the same type of fighter out at this point. No, he's fighting. not. And, and, and a lot, as, as Bert pointed out, a lot had transpired. And in his case, his skills had uh, degenerated a bit. And here he was still facing a heavyweight, mind you. And uh, he was not able to cope with uh, the Lewis power. I mean, it was a big fight. draw, but it was no, it was no yeah. great fight. The one thing I mentioned as a historical reference, when Khan is knocked down and out in the second fight, his involuntary motions throw his arms over his face in exactly the same, same yeah. pose as Jack Johnson in the 1915 mm -hmm. fight versus Willard, where he claimed he was hiding his eyes from the sun and Billy Khan was being knocked out at night mm -hmm. in the same pose. Mm -hmm. That's intriguing. Yeah, it is. And or one, repose. One, uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> and one accused of, of throwing the fight, but not in this case, in this knockout.
And welcome back to ESPN Classics Ringside Rivalries. I'm Brian Kenny. Welcome back and welcome back to Gleason's Gym in Brooklyn. Not far from here, just a mile or so across the East River, is where Rocky Graziano grew up on the tough streets of the East Side. The dead end kid packed a lot of power, but in Tony Zale, he met his match. The man of steel could absorb blows as well as deliver them. Over a 21 month period from 1946 to 1948, the two middleweights went at each other in three of the most memorable fights ever staged. All right, Bert. Tell us about Rocky Graziano. What's he all about? Rocky Graziano was the dead end kid. He really was. He once told me, he said, I never stole anything that didn't begin with an A. A purse, a car, a train. <laughs> I mean, he stole. He was really a dead end kid, and he took that approach into the ring. He was supposed to be in the brig during World War II for having clocked an officer. He escaped, fought under, his name is Rocco Barbella. He fought under the name Graziano. A friend of his, his name. They were looking for him. He's fighting. Mm -hmm. And he's fighting. Let me tell you how he's fighting. He knocks out Freddie Red Cochran, the welterweight champion, by holding his neck and beating him with the right hand. He knocks out Al Bummy Davis and then hits him when he's on the floor to further knock him out. He knocks out Marty Servo by standing over him when he gets up just hitting him. Anything and everything this dead end kid did, and he became a favorite of the crowd. Carmen, was he that dirty, Graziano? His reputation be the vicious puncher and very, very tough. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he really was a one handed puncher. Tell us about the first fight then. The first fight was unbelievable because the Man of Steel, Tony Zale, who'd been in the service for four years, and the title was in frozen during the duration, is what they said. Lewis's was, the middleweight title, Zale's was. Zale comes out, he's, he's an underdog in the first fight at Yankee Stadium. He knocks down Graziano in the first minute. Graziano promptly bounces up and starts beating everything out of him. By the end of the second round, Zale, A, is down, has to be dragged to his corner, he's broken, was down for the count of four at the bell. In those days, that ended the count. Couldn't come out, but did. And in the third round, he turns it around. Then it's Graziano's turn. They take turns beating each other until the sixth round, when Graziano hits Zale with some murderous punches, and Zale just hits him to the stomach. And Zale had probably the second greatest body attack in the history of boxing behind Billy Patrol. Almost buries his arm up to his elbow in Graziano's midsection. Graziano sinks to the canvas, can't catch his wind, and is counted out for the first time ever in the sixth round. Jump skip second fight, which now is in Chicago. Reason it's in Chicago, Graziano did not report to the commission a, a bribe attempt, which he turned down, but claimed a bad back mm -hmm. to even himself with the mob. Asking an awful lot and, <laughs> at that point in and, time. And, yeah. and he's banned in New York, but they take the second fight to Chicago. Exact opposite. Zale is beating Graziano, and by the sixth round, Graziano now drapes Zale over the ropes like wash on a line. He wins. After the fight, he takes the microphone and says, my, your bad boy did it. Somebody up there likes me. Jump skip to the Paul Newman film. Third fight, and that's where we are. We have two of the greatest warriors who have just done damage to each other over 12 rounds, six rounds apiece, meeting for the third time, and Zale is trying to come back to become the first man since Stanley Ketchell, Ketchell to regain the middleweight title. Let's pick it up, Bert. Well done. Rubber match of this uh, trilogy taking place June 10th, 1948. Newark, New Jersey. This is the only fight of the three that was filmed, and the uh, savagery of the rivalry is now on full display. Raw, primitive combat. Both men trained hard, of course, for this fight. It's unlikely either one uh, fought or uh, had the remotest chance of going the full 15 rounds, but they went at it to see who would last. Zale, Graziano, three. And here we are in the rubber match. Rocky put in a light left hand on the chin. Zale faints the left hand. Zale goes into a crouch, so does Graziano. Graziano moves away from a jab, misses the left hand over the head of Zale. Zale is short with a pecking left hand. He drives Rocky to the ropes, driving a left hand to the body, a right to the jaw, a left and a right to the head, another sharp right to the jaw by Zale. Graziano goes in and holds on for a moment, holding Zale against the ropes. And the referee, Paul Cavalier, gets them apart. It's round one for the middleweight championship of the world. Graziano standing up now, straight, bobs and weaves a little bit, goes in, takes a grazing left hand of the jaw thrown by Zale. Zale moving in on him, wraps his left hand around the head, no damage there, and again they go in and hold on and are tied up. 
at long range again. Zale thanks the left hand, comes in with a hard left hook to the jaw, and Rocky Graziano is down. He's at the flash knockdown. He's right up without a count. Rocky seems to be all right as they go back into action. They exchange light left hands to the head. Graziano drives the right to the body, is countered with a right to the body by Tony Zale, the man of steel from Gary, Indiana. Zale drives the right hand to the back. Graziano takes a light left hook on the jaw, two jabs on the mouth thrown by Tony Zale. Rocky is wild with a right hand over the head. Zale comes in driving a right to the midsection, misses the right hand over the head of Graziano. Referee Paul Cavalier goes over and now is getting them out of a clinch. At long range again here in round one, Graziano misses the left over the head, is countered by a left hook on the head by Zale. Zale biding his time. Shoots out a jab that's short, a sharp jab on the mouth by Zale, a short right hand of the body, and again they go into close quarters and tie each other up. Harder by the referee, they go back into action. Zale cautiously drives the right to the body, a left hook to the jaw, another left to the head, a right hand to the body by Tony Zale, and Rocky Graziano makes no return. He was down earlier in the round. Graziano takes a light left hook on the jaw, goes in, and they tie each other up in another clinch. The referee having a bit of trouble getting them apart this time. Now at long range again, Graziano shoots out a jab that's short, so does Zale, that's also short. Zale drives a left hook to the head, a connecting left by Tony Zale. He gets under a left by Rocky Graziano, who seems to be off his game at the moment. Graziano feints the left hand, drives the left hook to the jaw of Zale. Zale shoots out a left that's short, takes the left hook on the mouth, drives Graziano back with a left hook on the jaw. Graziano biding his time now, feints the left hand, takes the right to the body, a left hand to the head, and then puts his own left hook to the jaw of Zale as they go in close again. At long range, Graziano out of a crouch, misses a sweeping right uppercut, then misses the left hand. He's short with the left. Zale puts a light left on the jaw, a hard jab on the mouth by Tony Zale, a right that goes to the back, a left hook that hurts Graziano, a right hand to the body, another left hook to the jaw, and Graziano is hurt again and against the ropes. He takes the left and the right to the head, and the bell rings, and nobody hears it. After coming back from the brink of defeat to batter Zale in their second slugfest, Graziano declared that he had won the fight because somebody up there likes me. That, of course, is the title of the film that depicts Graziano's life story. Released in 1956, the film launched the movie career of Paul Newman, who starred as Graziano and also featured Tony Zale in a cameo role as himself. But did you know that another Hollywood legend appeared in the movie as well? Steve McQueen plays one of the young punks from Rocky's neighborhood. It was only his second movie appearance, and he didn't receive a screen credit. Speaking of credit, it's payback time for Tony Zale against his arch rival. Let's get back to their grand finale from 1948 and the bell for round two. Round two for the middleweight championship of the world. Rocky in the dark trunks. Zale in the purple trunks. The referee is Paul Cavalier. Rocky was down in the first round. Let's see how he does now. He's defending his title. Rocky comes in with a wild left that barely reaches the jaw of Tony Zale. Zale calmly drives the right hand to the head. Zale feints the left hand. Rocky coming in on him out of a half crouch. Sticks out a left that's short of the mark. Graziano drives the left hand to the jaw. It gets in there. Zale goes into a crouch, gets away from the left. His own left is short. Graziano drives to the right to the body. He takes the left and a right to the jaw by Zale. Graziano is short with the left hand. Zale drives the right to the body. Rocky hooks his own left hand to the jaw. A light jab on the nose by Tony Zale. Graziano out of a half crouch. He bobs and weaves a lot. He comes in there with a lead right hand to the jaw. Another right to the jaw by Graziano. Zale sticks out a left that's short. Another jab by Zale is short of the mark. Graziano sticks out a left hand. It also is short. Graziano out of a half crouch. Gets away from a pecking left. Takes a left hook on the jaw by Zale. Graziano, painting the left hand, sticks out a left that's short. Another is short of the mark. Zale backing away, puts a light jab on the chin, takes a hard left jab to the jaw thrown by Graziano. Graziano takes a light jab on the nose. Zale, biding his time, backs away, takes a grazing right to the chin, counters with a left that's blocked, and Graziano hooks the left hand to the jaw that may have hurt Zale. Graziano, out of a half crouch, takes a hard jab on the chin. Zale, feigning the left hand, pecks away with that left jab again, ducks the right, fired at his head. Graziano out of a half crouch gets away from three left leads by Tony Zale. Graziano ducks another left hand, sticks out a left that's short, hooks the left hand to the jaw of Zale. Zale feints the left hand, gets away from a light left thrown at his body by Graziano. Graziano a hard jab on the chin, drives Zale back a little bit. 
Graziano is the aggressor here in round two. After being hurt in round one, he takes a left and a right to the jaw. Graziano comes back with a short right to the jaw. That was a very hard punch. Zale comes in with a, a sizzling right to the jaw, a right to the body, a left hook to the head by Zale, and Graziano drives him back with two right hands to the head, and Zale goes in and holds on for a moment. The referee is Paul Cavalier as Zale drives a right to the body, a right to the jaw, putting Graziano on the ropes again. Graziano comes off the ropes, runs into a right to a body, and then gets a weight in the right. Graziano faints the left, hooks the left to the jaw, takes a jab on the mouth by Zale. Graziano's left goes to the head, a right, another left, and another right to the jaw by Z Graziano in his best rally of the fight so far. He puts another left hook to the jaw. He's evening things up here in round two. A right to the jaw by Graziano, and then he misses a right and a left. Scores with another right to the jaw of Zale. Zale dances up and down, takes a right to the body. His left hand of the body is blocked by Graziano. And again, the referee gets him apart. It's round two. Zale, biding his time, comes in with a hard left hook to the jaw of Graziano at the bell. Graziano, a hard right hand to the body of Zale. Zale, biding his time again, gets away from the right, drives the right to the body, a hard left hook to the jaw that may have hurt Graziano. Graziano is driven back and he's wobbly from the left hook to the jaw, and Zale is on him with a flurry of punches. Another left hook to the jaw, and Graziano almost goes down but doesn't. He takes a right to the body, a left hook to the jaw. Again, Graziano is staggered, and I don't know what's holding him up. He takes the right hand to the body. Zale drives the right hand that grazes the chin. Graziano comes back, fights gamely, but goes down from two left hooks on the jaw. And he's taking the count from referee Paul Cavalier. Graziano just up at the count of eight. He is a very wobbly young man. Zale coming after him again, trying for knockout. Drives a right to the body, a right and a left to the jaw. A left hook to the jaw, right up a cut on the mouth by Zale. A left hook to the jaw, and Graziano gamely fights back with the left hand to the chin. A right to the body, a left hook to the jaw by Zale again. And Graziano is thrown on the canvas. And the count is five, six, seven, eight. He's not going to make it. Nine, ten. He is knocked out, and Tony Zale has regained the middleweight championship of the world. The first middleweight to do that since Stanley Ketchum. Graziano was down on the floor for 30 seconds after getting knocked out, and Zale's knockout win gave him the rubber match in their trilogy and a historic milestone as he became the first middleweight champion to regain the crown since Stanley Ketchum did it in 1908. Sports Century with more now on the Zale-Graziano rivalry. We couldn't believe he came in the ring. He was very stiff and he wasn't animated. He wasn't you know, warming up. He just standing there. He just had no fire. And again, they go in and hold on and are tied up at long range again. Zale faints the left hand, comes in with a hard left hook to the jaw, and Rocky Graziano is down. It's a flash knockdown. He's right up without a count. Rocky said to me that he never remembered anything beyond the first round. Zale biding his time again, gets away from the right, drives the right to the body, a hard left hook to the jaw that may have hurt Graziano. Graziano is driven back and he's wobbly from the left hook to the jaw, and Zale is on him with a flurry of punches. Another left hook to the jaw and Graziano almost goes down but doesn't. Zale came out the third round, bam, left hook to all. We got scared, Rocky looked like he was hurt bad. Again, Graziano is staggered and I don't know what's holding him up. He took such a Beating and went down three times. Zale is short with a pecking left hand. He drives Rocky to the ropes, driving a left hand to the body, a right to the jaw. Graziano comes back, fights gamely, but goes down from two left hooks on the jaw. He just climbed up on the ropes, the first strand, the second strand, the third strand, and he went back into the ropes. It was terrible to let it go on, and Tony Zell, oh, just knocked him out. He was just like a dead man. He and Zale fought a total of 15 rounds in three contests. The most exciting 15 rounds in the middleweight division of the century. Next on the card, one of the nastiest rivalries in all of boxing. Willie Pep versus Sandy Sadler. These two gladiators who truly despised one another inside and outside the ring. Now, these two battled for the featherweight crown four times, mutual animosity increasing with each bout. 
both fighters frequently resorted to dirty tactics. We uh, have this quote now from the New York Times after their fourth and final fight in 1951. The quote, for roughness, disregard of ring rules and ethics and wild fighting, this surpassed anything seen in the three previous meetings of these bitter ring rivals. Both fighters were guilty of the collar and elbow, rough and tumble style of fighting made famous on the waterfront. Bert Sugar, was it that bad? They did everything. They didn't break the rules. They bent them so much so you didn't recognize the rules. Willie Pep was magnificent, by the by, a great featherweight champion. If Ray Robinson had a run of undefeated, with only not undefeated, but with only one loss, 132 fights, mm -hmm. Willie Pep has similar, if not greater, run of unbeaten streak. Except one thing, Willie, as the featherweight champion, was in a plane crash in 1947, where it was feared he would never walk again. Six months later, he's back as the featherweight champion fighting, and again winning. Mm -hmm. Now comes his next challenge in 48, a man named Sandy Sadler. Well, to understand Sandy Sadler, you must understand that he, he's fighting in the 126-pound featherweight division. He's five, nine and a half, five, ten. Mm -hmm. He's thin enough that he looks like he could work in an olive factory dragging the pimento through. He is so tall. <laughs> here's Willie, here's Sandy Sadler. Sandy Sadler knocks him out in the fourth round. A bodacious right hand, and Sandy Sadler has, I think, the third most knockouts in, in boxing history. They now fight again the next year, in 1949. And again, Sadler is heavily favored. Well, Willie is determined to win. Now, this is probably one of the, and they called him the Will of the Wisp for, for a good, good reason. He'd be here, there, everywhere. It was like a moonbeam. In this fight, he's got to take on Sadler, and Sadler's style, again, and height are bewildering as they push, shove, elbow, kick. And one time, Sadler has got Pep on the ropes, about ready to deliver a punch. Pep falls to his knees, climbs through Sadler's legs, and hits him from behind. I mean, they mm. did everything, and Willie was that quick. But still, he was having a lot of trouble with Sadler, and, and he told me, he said, until he stepped on his toes once. And Sadler said, ouch. Mm. He said, I stepped on his toes all night. <laughs> to get he, something on him. Yeah. He won the second fight, one of the greatest exhibits I have ever seen. Third fight, fourth fight, and the one you referenced, they were brawls. Sadler hurt his arm, hurt Pep's arm in the third, he retired, and he hurt it again in the fourth. And he retired again, but in that fourth fight, they're entwined in a, in a clinch on the ropes, and the referee tries to break it up. They, know, they just push him down. Yeah, they, the hell with this. They just both of them shove them down. They get at each other. No, as you say, this was a rivalry that was really emphasized by dislike from each for the other. Carmen, uh, you were friends with Willie Pep. What type oh, of man yeah, was Willie was Pep? Friends with Willie. What type of man was he? I thought he was a great fighter. Very clever. Very tricky. Do you, do you know and once? A pretty, pretty fair puncher too. You know, I think half those guys just collapsed out of exhaustion okay, trying run, to catch him. Run, run him out of gas. Yeah. That's right. There was one moment in one fight, Jackie Graves, 1943. He told people, and Jackie Graves was a hell of a right hand, uh, yeah, a left handed puncher. He told people in the press before the fight, watch me in the third round. I won't land a punch, I'll win the round. Mm -hmm. He fainted, he moved, he spun him. Guess That's what? the famous round. Yeah. Guess, guess what? He won the round on all cards. Yeah. That's how good Willie Pep was. Best oh, he was great. Yeah. He was great. Very clever, very quick. I have him as the third greatest fighter in the history of boxing. Best defensive fighter? Easily, but who knows defensive? He can't hit him. Right. I mean, as opposed to, with all deference to the gentleman on my left when he was fighting Fulmer, if they were lawyers, they could have said the defense rests. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> with Willie, it was always an action. Welcome back to ESPN Classics ringside from Gleason's Gym. Sugar Ray Robinson and Jake LaMotta fought six times. LaMotta handed Robinson his first career loss in 1943. But the best remembered fight from their series of legendary slugfests is the last one, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. LaMotta, the raging bull himself, trained for the fight at Gleason's. So let's drop in to Bobby Gleason's Gym in the Bronx, where LaMotta usually trains whenever a tough assignment awaits him. 
Leading his handlers up the stairs, the middleweight champion LaMotta, dethroned the stout-hearted French Moroccan Marcel Sedan in 1949 and has since successfully defended his title in three engagements. The bell rings. Jake stops whatever he's doing. Consequently, the exact amount of time is spent on each phase of training. His beautiful blonde wife is a familiar sight wherever LaMotta trains. Lamata in the black trunks is an aggressive, free-swinging fighter. He has power in either hand, and he excels in bull-like, brutal body attacks. Jake can also take a terrific battering without showing any ill effects. Endurance and stamina have always been in Lamata's favor, but the wear and tear of the ring has taken their toll, and Jake faces a severe test against Sugar Ray. Robinson and Lamata have fought five times, with Sugar Ray emerging victorious on four occasions. Five years have elapsed since their last meeting. LaMotta, since acquiring the middleweight title, has become a very cautious fighter. But come February 14, caution will be thrown to the wind as the champions meet his severest test, the dazzling and hard-punching Ray Robinson. Well, uh, much of what is known now uh, about uh, Jake LaMotta, I think, is uh, rests on Raging Bull <laughs> and what we've seen this generation, what they've seen of Jake LaMotta. So, uh, Bert, let me start with you. What type of man w was Jake LaMotta? Well, first of all, he, he, they say he was a great puncher. He only went to the body because he had very fragile hands, very small hands. In fact, he would have to shoot them with Novocaine before a fight. They were that fragile. Also, they talk about Robinson and LaMotta. LaMotta started in the amateurs as 189 pounds. You can see it in his frame. He then fought his first year as a pro as a light heavyweight, 175. Then came down to middleweight by starving himself so that he would be training on water just to keep 160. He was, you know, he was an unusual fighter in terms of making the most out of what he had. And he was a great fighter, but, and there's one point in that raging bull that he claims never happened. What's he that? never went across the ring and said anything to Ray Robinson after that fight because he had to sit on a stool for 20 minutes. Mm. After not going down. Uh, yeah. Something he took pride in later in life, throughout his life, saying he yes. never went down. But he had to sit on a stool, so he never went over to tell Ray, hey, you didn't knock me down. Right. Pete, what are your recollections of uh, LaMotta? Well, the reputation he had around New York, among other fighters, was that he was one of the worst human beings who ever lived. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, <laughs> and I think that after Walter O'Malley died, he probably had full claim on that title. <laughs> Um, but he was, as, as Bert said, a great fighter, I think. And determination, uh, heart, will. Even in the fights that uh, he did some business, the Billy Fox fight and some others, uh, he still refused to go down. He would take the beating. And I don't think he was so crucial to Robinson as, as uh, Dave points out in his wonderful book, as Fritzy Zivic was. When Ray finally fought Zivic, who was one of the dirtiest fighters ever and tough, uh, and came out the other end, I think Ray knew then how good he was. Yeah. He said he learned more from fighting him, Zivic, than all the other yeah. fights put together. Dave, yes. what did, uh, what did uh, Ray Robinson say about his battles with LaMotta? Well, the one thing I remember is, and you're probably right, uh, Bert, I don't think he said, you didn't knock me down. But I remember Ray telling me that as he, they left the ring, he could he looked over it, and everything in in Jake's face said Sneered. that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He right. was sneering as if to say, "You still didn't knock me down." He gave away a lot of size in those fights. Yeah, well, what did he say? He said, well, like 15, you know, 16 pounds. that was one of the first Matador bull fights, and and uh, you know, Ray said the Matador always wins, and he except for that first fight, yeah, he always did. He, he did more damage to. Jake LaMotta on February 14th, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, I think, than the uh, Capone gang did to Bugs Moran 22 <laughs> years earlier. And at least, at least LaMotta got up or didn't go down. The other poor seven guys on Clark Street are still there, I think. Well, LaMotta think didn't have any holes in them. <laughs> yeah. I think the early fights were tougher because Ray was still growing out of the welterweight uh, division. Sure. And so if if Jake was really 165 when he came in after more. eating or more, uh, he probably had a good 
lot of weight on, on Ray when Ray was 152, 53, really, for those fights. You know, he was probably also the first tough bull type fighter that Ray fought. When Ray was fighting at an earlier weight, younger weight, you know, you didn't get a guy like that. And all of a sudden, here was this guy in front of him. All right, they fought six times. Uh, this is the one that, uh, that exists uh, on film right now. Sugar Ray Robinson, welterweight champion of the world. Jake LaMotta, the middleweight champion of the world. They met Chicago Stadium, February 14th, 1951. One of the most famous fights in boxing history. And for the first time here on ESPN Classic, we present the bout using the radio call of the legendary Russ Hodges over the original telecast, enhanced also by a 16-millimeter film. No rabbit punching, no kidney punches. Be careful of your low punches, they may cost you a round. In case of a knockdown, I want you to go to your furthest corner and stay there till I tell you to come out fighting. Any questions? Shake hands and come out fighting. Now we're ready for the action in this fight, and here is your blow-by-blow -blow announcer, Russ Hodges. And believe you me, Jack Drees, this stacks up to be a real Pabst Blue Ribbon event. Sugar Ray, cool and confident. Jake Clamata continues to shadow box over his corner as they get the warning buzzer for round one in uh, what, well, it should be the dream box of the last 10 or 15 years. And here's the bell for round one, and out they come. Clamata in a crouch. Robinson leads first to the left hand of the Ford, but it was light. Lamata leads with uh, a left hand of the head, then goes to the midsection of Sugar Ray with a long left hand that shook Ray up quite a bit. Lamata trying to use his superior strength and weight in the infighting, pulling around. His left hand goes into Sugar Ray's forehead, but very left, very short. Here is uh, a left, light left hand from Sugar Ray now on the nose of uh, Lamata. Then Sugar Ray buries a right hand down in the midsection of Jake, the boy from the Bronx. Here is. Uh, Robinson stabbing away at the forehead with his left hand, and the nose of Lamata is reddening a bit as Robinson misses a long overhand right hand and then retreats as Lamata pounds away at the midsection and is tied up partially by Robbie. Then Robbie finishes the clinch, and Lamata and Jake's uh, right eye is reddening quite a bit as Robinson continues to stab and run. Not really running, but continuing to move. Robinson with two light left comes inside, chops the right hand at the ear of the middleweight champion of the world, Sugar Ray, of course, the welterweight fighting at 155 tonight, and here is Lamata trying to bull Robbie around and throw him away, and Robbie just held on as they break out of the clinch. Lamata coming in very low, and it's Robinson stabbing away at that eye, and he continues the left hand, and now Lamata with two left hands high on the forehead of uh, Robinson, and a left hook from Jake Lamata, the forehead of uh, Lamata, reddening a bit. He throws a left hand at uh, Sugar Ray's head, and Sugar Ray was not there. Ray waves and bobs as he comes in and lashes the nose twice with his left hand. And Lamata misses a vicious left hook for the head of Sugar Ray. Then Ray continues to retreat and misses the left hook of his own at the head of uh, Jake Lamata. Now Lamata with two left hands to the midsection. And a left hook to the head and Robinson moves back to the rope. Now moves in. Lamata swelling a bit beneath the right eye. Robinson lashes out with two light left hands for the forward, another light left hand. As Lamata comes in with his left hand high on Sugar's forehead, Sugar backing away. Robinson beating a retreat as Lamata chases him around the ring now, and then goes to work on the midsection with two left hooks, and uh, Sugar Ray staggers away from the force of the Bronx floor. Lamata inside, fighting powerfully, goes with the left hook under the heart, and Robinson breaks ground again as Jake is content to take the left to the face. And now Lamata pounding to the midsection with the left and the right. Robinson continuing to move, and he has started to muss up the nose of Jake Lamata a bit with that constant left hand. Lamata's left hand hooking for the nose of Sugar Ray slid on over the nose, and uh, Robinson has uh, Lamata pawing at the nose, and Lamata seems to stagger Robbie a bit as Robbie was going along the ropes. Lamata buries his left hand deep in Robinson's midsection, and then Jake misses the long left hand, thrown for the head. And Jake starts to throw that lethal right of his with about five seconds left to go in round one. Robinson short with left hand, and there's the bell to win round. Well, for round number four. Sugar Ray Robinson in the white. Robinson lashing out with a left hand and another straight left from Ray. A left hook by Lamata, high on the forehead. Lamata very powerful inside, runs into a terrific right hand. And a left hook, Robinson nails him on the rope. Up to our past boot of a microphone, but Lamata held on and weathered the storm. Then Lamata ran into an uppercut and a severe left hook. And Lamata staggers across the ring and weaves and bobs to escape Robinson. As Robinson nails him with left and right and chases him with that straight left of his. But Lamata 
keep plodding on after being badly hurt by a terrific right hand that landed on his ear. Now Robbie nails him over the left eye with a straight left again. Robinson bleeding from the mouth as Jake Lamotta continues to club with his left hand when he gets in close to Sugar Ray. Ray's superior reach taking its toll. Robinson with the left of the nose and another left and he backs away from the left of the head. And a right cross by Robbie and it's staggered taking the almost went down. He missed a bristling right uppercut for the whiskers that would have put Lamotta down for the first time in his ring career. Now back in the way is Robbie as he bleeds from the mouth a bit and Jake plods in and a right cross from Sugar Ray and Lamotta's hurt and may go down. He went down almost to his knees to escape the punch but nothing touched the floor. Now, a left hand in from Sugar Ray again as Jake comes moving in on him. It's the right hand of Robinson that started to take its toll as Robbie sets him up for it with those continuous left jabs of his. Two left jabs by Robbie, a right uppercut that he misses, and a left hook that he misses, and then he pushes Jake Lamato away. And Lamato, now as Robinson backs out of Lamato's own corner, and it's Robbie starting a right hand. He doesn't throw it. He misses a short left to the midsection. And Lamata lands a short left into the nose of Sugar Ray. Lamata goes inside with the right hand of the midsection and then uh, shoots his left hand in for Sugar Ray's head. Ray moving in with two lefts to the eyes. Flicking in that left hand, but it's annoying and it's uh, rolling up a lot of points for Sugar. Sugar backing away, crossing his right hand to Lamata. And Lamata moves back in his tag with a right uppercut and a right cross and a left hook by Sugar Ray. And then Ray gets inside to tie him up with a minute left to go. In round four, Lamata going on the attack now, following Sugar Ray around. Ray moving always away from the left hand of Jake, and Jake tags him with the left hand as Sugar moves to the rope. Lamata with a straight left hand for the nose of Sugar Ray, which appears to be swollen just a bit. Now, Lamata with a left hook to the midsection. It's a left hook to the head, and Robinson appeared to be addled a bit by that tremendous blow, which is probably the worst he has taken so far tonight. Now, Lamata down to the midsection with the left hand, and a... A right cross that uh, had Sugar covering up. Ray once again uses his left hand to try to slow down the bull from the Bronx of New York. Robinson has his left hook blocked, intending for the midsection of Jake Lamata. Here's Robbie with his left hand out, but Lamata goes in with the jab. Twice to the eyes of Sugar Ray, and Robinson hands a terrific left hook on Jake Lamata's jaw as uh, Lamata was coming in. Then Lamata with the left hand to Sugar Ray's jaw, and they're using the left hands now quite freely. Both boys jabbing as the bell ends round four. The fifth round of a 15-round world championship fight for the middleweight title here in Chicago, and there they go. Both boys have attending positions in their corners tonight with honorary second cards. Two minutes to go of round number five. blood from Robinson's nostril. The left with the right cross. One minute to go round number five.
Half a minute to go of the fifth round. One half a minute to go. There's the bell ending round number five. Speech for round seven. Jake Lamotti getting some final words of instruction before he comes out. And here we go for round seven for the middleweight championship of the world. A real pass blue ribbon event. Here's a straight left by Robbie as Lamotta has been content to take Robinson's Sunday punches and just try to get in his own. Here is another left hand by Robinson and he runs into a left hook just thrown by the middleweight champion. Another left hand in by Sugar Ray. Lamotta fighting as though he's a man with a grim destiny, moves in and tags that uh, right jaw of Robbie's again with his left hand. And they exchange good left hooks in both boys, Feldman and Feldman Plenty. Robinson misses a long overhand right, thrown for that rock ribbed chin of the Bronx Bull. Now, Lamotta comes in and is tagged over the eye with a left hand, then buries his left hand under the heart of Sugar Ray and wrestles him along the ropes. And Sugar Ray breaks the roll along, along the ropes and shoots his left hand in for the nose of Jake Lamotta. Robbie moving away again. Lamotta following them around with that uh, peculiar crouch, that ape-like crouch that he uses, but he certainly seems to be able to get those blows in. Now as Jake starts to come in, Robbie buries a right hand into the midsection of Jake Lamotta. A straight left hand in there by Robbie, and he almost tripped as he was moving away, but it was not as a result of a blow. Now over in Robinson's own corner, Lamotta had him tied up, but Robbie skidded along the ropes and got away. A left hand in by Robinson on the nose of Lamotta. Lamotta clubs his right hand to the body, is tagged with a short left hand on the chin, as Jake is always moving to the attack and uh, gets that chin of his into a lot of trouble, but he can punch his way out of it. Robinson drifting back now as Lamotta comes to him. Outside of a little uh, blood from the nose of Robinson, this has been uh, a very clean fight from that respect. Now Lamotta is tagged with a right cross as he moves into Sugar Ray. Sugar Ray with a left hand and Robinson along the ropes. Lamotta follows him around. His eyes very grim, very determined. Robinson is staggered with a tremendous left hook as he breaks ground to go over to his own corner. We can see his eyes. His eyes are clear and he makes Lamotta miss a terrific left hand thrown for the head. And here is Robinson missing a left hook. Run for the head of Jake Lamotta, then he scores with a straight left hand on the chin of Jake. Here's uh, Robbie scoring with two left hands on the chin now. And a right cross by Sugar, one of his best right hands of the night. And Lamotta just sinks a little lower in his crouch, comes up in the clinch, and hangs on. Another left hand by Sugar Ray on the nose of Jake Lamotta. And another left hand and a right cross. And Robbie missed a right hand, a terrific right hand, as Lamotta was weaving away from him. Now, Jake, with his gloves up very high, continues to plot in. Robbie bounces away and scores with the left hook to Jake as Jake landed his right hand down to the midsection. And it's Lamotta with two left hands in for the forehead of Sugar Ray. Then Lamotta with a two-fisted attack to the body, but when he moved it up to the head, Robinson was not there. Now, Lamotta with the left hand in on the nose of Sugar Ray as Ray beats a retreat. Then the exchange left hand, the straight left hand. Now, a two-fisted attack by Lamotta once again downstairs on Sugar Ray, but... Ray was picking them off on his gloves. Now Lamotta with a straight left into the chin, and it appeared to hurt Ray just a bit. Ray moving away. Lamotta follows him around. A left hand under the eye of Jake Lamotta, and another left with Sugar Ray as Lamotta gets way inside, starts to throw his right and holds it up, and Sugar Ray breaks it. You know, I think uh, Jake Lamotta's line was probably the best. He fought uh, Sugar Ray so many times, he got sugar diabetes, you know? And uh, every fight was a great fight. Every fight was a great fight. I don't think in all the fights that Sugar Ray, as great as he was, ever even knocked down Jake. You know, uh, they, they were just, uh, they were wars. They were literally wars out there, you know? Coming eight rounds will tell, and it's Lamotta burying his right fist into the midsection, having his left hand blocked with Sugar Ray. And Ray, as Lamotta comes in, Lays that left hand of his right in on the nose. Another left hand for Sugar Ray. Here's uh, Lamotta moving in, and his uh, nose once again runs into that fist as he tries to bring back his right hand and throw it. It's uh, Lamotta coming in on that crouch again. Robinson started to move to the attack with the right hand, and as he saw Lamotta bring back his right fist, he moved away. Lamotta plods in. Robinson backs away from a left hook that landed on the midsection. Here's Robbie picking off. The head of Jake Lamotta with two left hands, straight ones into the head. Lamotta punching to the body now more than he was in the earlier round. And it's Lamotta throwing the right hand partially blocked with the left shoulder of Sugar Ray Robinson. Sugar Ray missing the right uppercut, misses the left hook. And Lamotta continues to just bounce in on him 
and misses his uh, left hook as Robbie breaks ground and moves back again. Lamata misses a short left hook for the head. Jake missing more in this round than he has so far. Robinson using the left hand, a sticking left hand in there. And Lamata switches his attack to the body, and Robinson picks them off with his elbows. Then they exchange left hands into the bridge of the nose. Another left by Sugar Ray. The left eye of Lamata reddening, but not starting to swell. Both boys in superb condition. Here is a left hand, a wheeling left hook missed by Sugar Ray Robinson as Jake Lamato is moving inside. Now Robbie, with his hair plastered down from the water they used on him, bounces away, and uh, Jake goes in with a couple of left hooks high on the head. Here's Robinson tagging Lamato to the midsection with the left hand, and Lamato goes in with a two foot of the back, scores with one left hook and misses the one that might have put Robinson down as Sugar Ray moves in. Now Ray moves in with a straight right cross into the chin, a good one, and a straight left hand to the nose, and a swinging right by Ray that misses its target, and he lands his left jab, and Lamato runs into that left jab and misses the left hook of his own. Jade Jake just continues to stalk. He misses with his uh, left hook and then runs into two left hands on the chin. As Robinson has hit him a million times tonight, and Jake doesn't appear to mind him at all. Now Robbie continues to move away as Lamata was pumping his left hand on the top of the head. Here's uh, Robinson with two left hands into the nose, a right uppercut by Jake, and then uh, Sugar Ray lands a right uppercut of his own. It landed, however, down uh, on the chest rather than on the chin as Jake had that chin well protected, believe you me. Here's a couple of left hands by Robinson. He misses a long right hand. He misses another long right hand. And Jake Lamata grabs him and ties him up here in round eight with about 30 seconds left to go. Lamata scoring with a steering left hook, and Robinson breaks ground and moves away. Then uh, Robbie bounces back and makes Lamata miss a right hand, and Robbie scores with a good left hook throw in close. Robbie with a flurry of left and right to the head and a right hand down onto the heart. Here in the last 15 seconds now of round eight at Chicago Stadium. Another left hand by Robinson to Jake Lamata. Lamata with a long right hand to the head of Sugar Ray, and uh, Ray steps inside, misses the left, misses the right, scores the left hook as he was really throwing that weather. And there's the bell for the end of round eight in Chicago Stadium is going back. And round nine, where condition will have to start telling. And it's Lamata going to work on the midsection with the left hand. Robinson tries to hold him at bay with his straight left hand into the nose. It's uh, Jake Lamata plotting in, and he runs into a savage left hook as thrown by Sugar Ray Robinson. Robinson with the left hand down on the nose as he was hitting down on uh, Jake, who's in his crouch. Now Sugar Ray tries to straighten that head of his up with a couple of bouncing left hands off that nose. Jake comes in on that bare like crouch of his, and uh, as he starts to throw his left hand, Sugar Ray Robinson ties him up. This scrap has not been marred by much clinching. They've been laying it on all the way. Robinson is away from the left hook that Lamata started to throw, then Sugar Ray nails the head with a straight left hand as Jake was coming in. Here's Robinson with the right hand down for the midsection, partially blocked with the left glove of Lamata. Lamata comes in, scores with the left hook, and runs into a straight left hand thrown by Sugar Ray Robinson, the welterweight king, fighting the middleweight king, Jake Lamata, tonight at Chicago Stadium. Here's a left hand by Lamata that uh, lands on the forehead of Sugar Ray. Sugar Ray almost slipped in the center of the ring as he started to throw a right, held it up, moved away. Landed a couple of lefts of his own. Another left by Sugar Ray as he pushes Jake Lamato away. Two left hands bounce off the forehead. And another one is thrown by Sugar Ray. And Jake misses a wild roundhouse swing. The gallery cheered there, but uh, Lamato's uh, right hand was just a bit short. Here are two more left hands by Sugar Ray. And a right cross by Sugar. And then he fell into Jake as though he thought Jake might go down, but Jake was having no part of going down. Lamato misses a long, looping overhand right as Jake has been uh, really trying to score with that right hand tonight, and he's landed it on a couple of good occasions. Lamata runs into a left uppercut and a straight left from Sugar Ray, then goes inside and is tagged twice on the right ear with Robinson's left hook. Here is Lamata pulling to the ropes, and uh, we almost had a guess down here, but uh, Robinson slid away. Here's Robbie as uh, Lamata stalks into him. Robbie continuing to flick out that left hand, ready to throw the right. Lamata with a couple of left jabs of his own to the face of Sugar Ray. And Lamata with a good left hand down to the solar plexus. Had a lot behind that one. Then he misses a left hook to the head of Ray. And then uh, runs into a right uppercut thrown by Robinson. A left hand in for Lamata's rock ribbed chin by Sugar Ray Robinson. And uh, Robinson lands three straight left hands and misses a right hook without having a blow in exchange by Jake Lamata. Then Jake pushes Robbie away, throws the left hand in under the heart. Jake uh, appears to be tiring a bit. He runs into a right uppercut and a left uppercut thrown by Sugar Ray and a straight left thrown by Ray Robinson. Then in Robinson's own corner, Lamata gets him tied up but misses the blows. That would have counted. He missed the left hook and the right cross. Another straight left hand in by Sugar Ray. With Lamata following him around, and Lamata staggers just a bit. But the left hook thrown by Ray again. And Ray, with two straight left hands on the chin, bounces Lamata away from there, and Lamata staggered. 
And then Ray runs, sends another beautiful looping right hand on the chin of Jake. Jake pins Bobby in the rope opposite our Pat screw ribbon microphone, but misses the right hand that would have hurt Robbie. Robbie very accurate now with his left and his right, and uh, Lamata backs away from a steering left hook as the bell ended round nine. Both boys on their feet, ready to go for round ten. And Robinson tries to tee off with his right hand, and Lamata slid under. Slid under the right hand thrown by the welterweight champion, Sugar Ray. Then Ray bounces his left hand off Lamata's nose, moves in stride. With a left hook, then breaks ground. Lamata goes in with two left hands high on the forehead of Sugar Ray. Ray with a good left hook, and then he misses the right cross in the business end of the 1-2. Jake Lamata pushes him away, follows in. Lamata with his left hand high on the forehead. Then uh, Jake, blinking a bit with his right eye, ran into another of those uh, patented left hooks of Sugar Ray. And Ray staggers Lamata and sends him back to the rope with a left uppercut. And a left hook, and Lamata came walking into him with his hands down as though to say, go ahead and hit me. And Robinson backs away and jabs once, twice, three times to the chin of Jake Lamata. Lamata missing two left hands in for the forehead. Then he scores with a high right hand over the eye of Sugar Ray. Ray spins out of the corner, wheels away, then misses the left hook, then scores with a straight left hand in for the mouth of uh, the middleweight champion of the world, Jake Lamata. Robbie with two left hands in on the nose and another left hand by Robinson as Lamata is not doing much swinging and he fades away from a right overhand right thrown by Sugar Ray Robinson. Here is Robinson with a left hand in for the forward and a left hook in for the chin of uh, Jake Lamata and Robinson pounds his right hand in on the chin of the Bronx Bull. Lamata just plotting in, tagged with left and left and left as Robinson continues to flash out with that left hand and then Robbie backs away from the left hook. The only blow really thrown in this round was Jake Lamata. Robinson felt the midsection of Lamata with a tremendous right hand as Lamata was coming in. Robinson with two left hands in for the nose. And uh, then Jake going into his bare-like crouch once again. Here in round 10, here's a left hook for Robbie that is partially blocked. Lamata weaves away and is tagged with two left hands as Sugar Ray leaps to the attack once again. As Sugar Ray appears to be starting to fight the fight that he wanted to all the way. Two left hands in Beret on that swollen face of uh, Dick Lamata. Right up a cut, snaps Lamata's head back. And then at close quarter, Lamata clinches just briefly, then pushes Robinson away. Robinson, two left hands in the nose. Another left hook by Sugar Ray as he's just about calling his shot. A right hand by Robinson. And uh, Lamata looks a bit bewildered now and certainly very tired. Two left hands in for the forehead of Lamata and a right uppercut by Sugar Ray Robinson. And Lamata takes them all and refuses to go down. Sugar Ray bounces away, his left hand's in on the forehead. Twice, three times, four times, Lamata scores with a clean shot and landed on the top of the head of Sugar Ray. Two left hands in by Robbie, and a left hook and a right cross, and Lamata was glad to grab and hang on. He was in real distress that time. 25 seconds left in round 10. Lamata running into Sugar Ray. Ray continuing to lash out with his left hand. Condition starting to tell here in this round. Another straight left by Robbie and another one and a short left hook by Jake Lamata. Lamata peppered on the nose three times by Robinson's left hand and Robbie misses a long overhand right and nails Jake coming in with a left hook and a right cross and a right up a cut by Sugar Ray Robinson. Almost put Jake Lamata down but he battles in and was still on his feet trying to throw leather when the bell ended round 10. He was voted. Last year they voted. Did you know that? Pound for pound, the greatest fighter that ever lived. And we fought six times. And you don't fight six times unless they're very close. I hypnotized myself that nobody could hurt me. I didn't know at the time I was hypnotizing myself, but I convinced myself so strongly that nobody could hurt me. And Robinson could knock me down. I was helpless. I couldn't lift up my arms. He could knock me down. I was helpless because because after all the weight I lost and, and what I had to go through, and for 10 rounds I wouldn't have fight, but I couldn't lift up my arms. For the next three rounds, I couldn't lift up my arms. Then he was hitting me and he, I really, I make a joke out of it. But he had no power with his punches. He was hitting me so much, he had no power. His arm was tired. Well, there's no question Jake LaMotta had uh, respect for Sugar Ray Robinson and that the Raging Bull took a lot of pride in his ability to take punishment from his nemesis. Punishment, though, hardly does justice to the furious battering Lamata withstood in round 11. On their feet, ready to go for round 11, and it's Robinson missing an overhand right. First blow of the round, and as Lamata tries for the midsection, he's tagged by a short right uppercut by Sugar Ray. And Ray beats his retreat as Lamata flattens in, and it's Robinson with two straight left hands in for the nose, and a right uppercut and a thumper in there by Sugar Ray. 
It's almost bounced the mouthpiece out of Jake LaMotta, the middleweight champion's face. Here's a left hook with Sugar Ray, and he spins away from Jake LaMotta as Jake follows him around. A left hand down under the heart of Jake. Here is uh, the left hand of Robinson, very busy. And a left hook goes in by Sugar Ray. LaMotta just plotting in, very gamely, and he does throw one left hook that Sugar Ray backs away from. Ray gets over in a neutral corner and is away from the right hand thrown by Jake LaMotta, and then as LaMotta comes in, missing with left and right, Robinson just moves away from him. Of round 11, Robinson with two left hands in for the nose of Jake LaMotta. Another left hand by Sugar Ray. Sugar Ray with a right cross to Jake LaMotta's left eye as Jake was coming in. That rock rib chin of the champion, how he can take it. A left hand and a right uppercut by Sugar Ray. The left hand was straight, the uppercut right into the chin. Another straight left with Sugar Ray and another straight left. LaMotta, this is a left hook thrown for the head. Sugar Ray backing away, lands the left of the midsection. Uh, and uh, Robinson is worn for a low punch. And Robinson threw a warning from Frank Secor. Then he scores with a left up and got a right cross. LaMotta staggers to the rope, and he may go, but he used the ropes to support him. Now he stalks back in on Sugar Ray. Ray with the left of the body, and then LaMotta gains so that he is plugged back with a left hook for the chin, and Frank Secor, the referee, breaks him. With 45 seconds, there's a dazed, bewildered look in LaMotta's eyes as he plods in on Sugar Ray, and Ray belts him under the heart with a right hand. A right uppercut, a left hook. Another left hook for LaMotta. He staggers back on his heels, but he does not go down. Robinson with another left hand. LaMotta staggers to the rope. A right cross nails him on the chin. He crunches with Robbie. 30 seconds to go. It's a tired LaMotta now. Robinson calling his shot. Left hand into the chin. Another left hand into the chin. Another right hand might do it. And Jake LaMotta, who has never been down in 94 fights, is in danger of going down as his hit with a left hook. Robinson with a right up attack. The champion is reeling across the lane. He runs into a right. Robinson slices him in the nose with the right hand. And there's 10 seconds to go in round 11. And Robinson scores with a right uppercut. A left hook, a right uppercut. And Jake Lamotta is still on his feet. And what is keeping him up there? And the bell ends round 11. Wow, is what we can say. <laughs> that is, was, uh, that's incredible punishment. I, I heard. I heard. Wow. As we watched it, I said to Pete, He's the only fighter, really, when you think about it, who could be moving backwards and still be the aggressor. Mm -hmm. the and he was landing every yeah. punch cleanly going yeah. backwards. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Russ yeah. Hodges with the call there, who, uh, as we talked about as well, uh, later that year would be screaming the Giants win the pennant. And uh, with the call in that fight, that's the 11th round. Uh, early on, Sugar Ray Robinson absorbing a lot of punishment. He took real shots, hard, a barrage of shots from LaMotta and seemingly unfazed by it, Kurt. Well, but he went into that fight with a battle plan, and it was to wear out LaMotta by letting him, almost like Ali and Foreman, letting him wilt down like, you know, a, a hose that you turn the pressure off of. I mean, here's LaMotta. He's going at him. Robinson is bobbing and weaving. He's taking some punches, but blocking a heck of a lot of them, but he's letting him throw punches and then coming off the ropes doing his damage. Just the 12th round. Now, these, yeah. Robinson comes back. He's got real power. These are sharp, hard punches. And he's hitting them with everything he throws. Hmm. I mean, you know, he, he's just, he, miss. he mails them. Here it is. There's take there it. There weren't many missed punches no. there. This is something that uh, you'd get a high percentage on copy box today. Pete, Pete, what are your thoughts watching this uh, when you see Robinson come back with that? That he's even better than I thought. Right, right, <laughs> <laughs> right. That's it. You think you're wow. Right. <laughs> Nobody should ever call themselves Sugar <laughs> no. ever again. Well, in fact, he fought a fighter named George Sugar Costner. That's Sugar Costner. Oh, yeah. and at the weigh-in. At the weigh-in, he said, what, how, he almost, up how to dare him. you? No, no, at the weigh-in, he walked up to him and said, Sugar, there's only one Sugar. Don't, you know, and, I'm the only sugar. And, and how long did it take him to knock him like out? Seconds. One round. Yeah. He, he was seconds. the only person. In fact, I think Ray Leonard called him to get permission. He did. That's right. The name used. The name and Ray sugar. gave him permission, but he, you know, I wish he hadn't. Let's put it that <laughs> <Yeah>. way. <laughs> that's the eleventh <laughs> round. Well, but that's how he came by that name. In fact, it was Jack Case who said to in George Gainford, in Watertown, New York. He said that you've got a amateur. sweet fighter there. Right. 
And he and said, sweet as sugar. That's right. All right, that's the 11th round. Let's pick it up again after that battering. Uh, it's not over uh, just yet. Uh, Lamata still on his feet. Let's go to round 12. Frank Sikora had not heard the bell. All right, there is the bell for round 12 to get underway. And it's Jake Lamata with a chin of his running into two right hands. Why Sugar Ray is way is teeing him up with his left hand now and trying to put him down, something that Jake has never done in his professional career. A left hook and a right uppercut and a straight left for the chin of Jake Lamata. And Jake staggers back above our Pat screwed up in microphone and he's in real trouble. Robinson pounds him to the midsection with a right hand. Lamata comes inside and is tagged twice on the nose with uh, Robinson's vicious left. Another left hand by Sugar Ray. Another left for Sugar Ray as he looks for the opening for the right and he throws it and he lands. Then he misses a right uppercut. And Jake falls into a clinch and hangs on. Now Jake following Sugar Ray around, ever willing. Robinson with three left hooks in the right leg of Jake Lamata skidded and almost won out from under him, but he was able to get some traction and stand up. Robinson pecking away at the forehead, scores with his right cross after two left hands, another left by Sugar Ray. Lamata pounding in there and is tagged under the right eye with a right hand, and he once again falls into a clinch with the only one minute gone in round 12. Robinson with a left hand for the nose, a right hand for the midsection, a right up a cut with Sugar Ray, a left hook, and Lamata cannot get his hands up. He staggers around the ring, and Robinson belabors him with left and right, and Lamata grabs him and hangs on. It's one of the most merciless beatings I've ever seen anybody receive in a prize ring, believe you me. Here is a right hand under the eye of Jake Lamata, and he appears to be cut under there now by Sugar Ray. Ray swings a left uppercut and tags Lamata on the chin, and Jake just seems to settle a little deeper in his tracks and refuse to go down. Now Robinson's left hand in for the forehead three times, four times. The left hook is working beautifully, and Lamata grabs Sugar Ray and holds on again. Lamata's face now is a crimson smear, and Robinson tees off on him with his right uppercut, his right uppercut twice under that left eye of Lamata, which has opened up. Now Robinson with a left hand of the body, a swinging right to the chin, a right uppercut, a left hook by Robinson, all of them lethal blows, and Lamata continues to stagger around and not able to do much about it. Robinson with a left hook and a right uppercut, a right cross. Lamata right above our pass through the microphone is nailed with everything in the book, but he won't go down. And he grabs and holds on to Sugar Ray, and he's one of the weariest battlers you've ever seen. Robinson with a right uppercut, a left hook, a right overhand right, a right to the midsection by Robbie, without a return from Jake, and believe you me, Robbie's arms are about as weary now as Jake Lamata's entire body. Now Lamata out in the open, getting his left hand up to try to ward off Sugar Ray. Ray with a chopping right hand into the chin of Lamata. Lamata's face swollen and bleary, and here is Robinson with a left hook and a right cross, and uh, Lamata staggers into the rope and then grabs hold of Sugar Ray and holds on again. Here is Lamata, tagged with the right hand. He's utterly powerless to defend himself as Robinson wings him in, and the bell ends round 12 with a bristling right hand on the chin and a right uppercut, and Robinson misses the left hook and then wails away with everything that he's got, and Lamata takes it and takes it all and backs away, cannot get his hand up, and here is a another left hand in by Sugar Ray, and a left hook, and Lamata's head is almost snapped off his shoulders. Robinson brings up another short right hand, and Lamata tries to tie him up, and referee Frank Sikora breaks it. There's a very bad swollen spot now under the left eye of Jake Lamata. Robinson with a long overhand right, and he nails Lamata coming in, and then Jake grabs him, and his knees sag. But his game to the core is the Bronx Bull, the middleweight champion of the world, at least until uh, this one is over. Here are two, three, four, five left hands on the nose. Lamata cannot get his hands up. Robinson with his left hand in for the head and a right hand in for the midsection. And Jake Lamata runs into a left hook as thrown by Sugar Ray. Lamata plotting in. Runs into a left hand thrown on the forehead. Robinson with a right hand thrown down to the midsection. Only one minute is gone here in round 13. Robinson looking for an opening. Comes in and scores with a terrific right uppercut and two left hooks to the chin. Misses a right uppercut. Then uh, Lamata just lurches back against the ropes and stands there. And Robbie goes to him and smashes him in the nose with his left and his right. His right hand right down on the cheekbone. And Jake appears powerless to defend himself. And the swollen spot on his left cheek has opened up and is spilling crimson down his face. Robinson with a straight overhand right with a minute and a half left to go in uh, round 13. Lamata 
trying to hold on. Some of the crowd yelling, stop it, but you don't do that to a champion. He has to go out fighting. Lamata misses the left hook thrown for the head of Sugar Ray. Ray with two left hands on that swollen left eye of Jake's. Another left hand. Then Jake is able to move away from the right hand, and then he falls as a falls back to the ropes, but does not go down as Robinson tags him with a straight right hand on the forehead, and Lamata seems both to come away from the rope, but he does come out, and Robinson hits him with a powerful right hand, and left up the cut, a right cross, and Lamata holds on, and they're going to stop it. Ray Robinson is the new champion of the world. One question before you go, Ray. When did you know that you had him? Because you were fighting pretty evenly for eight rounds. Well, that's the way we planned the fight. We figured Lamar would be strong as he was the first part of the fight, and the last part of the fight he would weaken. We figured to box along the first part of the fight and wait till he showed signs of weakening, which he did. I see. And in, the, in those late rounds after the eighth, he showed signs, and my manager told me to start throwing open up the heavier punches. Well, Ray, my congratulations to you. You're a wonderful champion. As a welterweight, I hope that you're the greatest in the middleweight division ever knew. All right, there we go. So what, Bert, is the, the legacy of, uh, of this fight? How, you know, we look at this and we're amazed by the, uh, the ferociousness of it. What, what did this do for both men? Well, for Ray Robinson, it solidified his credentials, if you will, moving up now from welterweight to win the middleweight title. For Jake LaMotta, it would take a time in coming. He would go on, fight, even get knocked down, which nobody remembers, by a fighter named Danny Nardico a few years later. It took a movie by Scorsese called Raging Bull that came out of a book about this thick. I think it uh, was the Z's in the phone book that they put into it. But Raging Bull became the legacy of Jake LaMotta. And as Henry Winkler Irving Winkler. Irving yes. Winkler said, it's a Winkler. No, Not Irving the Winkler. Yes. Irving Winkler, the producer and director, said, we almost made him a nice guy, but it wasn't quite possible. <laughs> he was actually <laughs> upset in that he said he never actually used profanity. He said it was his brother and other people around him, but a lot of other things. That, to take issue with that one uh, thing is, is, is something else. Uh, Dave, where did, uh, where did Ray Robinson rate this among his, his great performances? Well, he just, you know, he liked the idea of finally getting rid of the, the, the LaMotta curse or whatever you want to call it. Even though he usually won the fight, Lamada was always there for the guy, as the guy who had once beaten him. Mm -hmm. Pete, what do you think? Where does this I, I think the legacy w was slightly different. Um, this fight, because it was seen by a lot of people, um, showed that boxing could have beauty to it. That he, as brutal as it can be, as brutal as that fight was, it was a very tough fight. People were hurting each other. It, it had the thing that Robinson brought to the whole sport, which was it could be beautiful too. It was a kind of savage ballet of some kind. And I think that washed over a generation of writers, for example. I think everybody from Mailer to Baldwin to a whole lot of people uh, went on for 30 years remembering that that's what it could be. Mm -hmm. And I think in that sense, Robinson made the sport into something more than just a lot of colorful guys showing up and making a lot of money. It became another thing altogether. Jake LaMotta also continues to make, if you will, traffic out of this. And, and he ha it has wheels. He continues to say in his monologue, I fought Sugar Ray Robinson so many times, it's a wonder I don't have diabetes. Mm -hmm. So he's continuing to use that as his, his final coda for part of his monologue. Uh, Sugar Ray uh, Robinson at this uh, point is uh, 29 years old, just shy of being 30, so still at his peak. I guess that Robinson's series with Jake LaMotta showed just how great a fighter he was. He was too good for anyone in his own weight class, so they put him against LaMotta, who was this tough middleweight. So although he may have been more dazzling early in his career, in the late 30s, and dominant. He was so great that he, he in effect had to be handicapped by moving up in weight class to fight bigger guys, otherwise it was, it was a performance and not a contest.